Earlier this year, I ended up at a little antique flea market and I ended up snagging this one for about five bucks. The guy had a $10 price tag on it, but it was at the end of the day and he wanted to get rid of it. Anyways, I love it when there's contents in the bottle and this one had a really interesting top, so I took it. So let's dig in and let's see what this story holds on this episode of Antique Bottle Stories. <laughs> Today's story starts with Nancy Stewart. She was born in 1848 in Tennessee. Nanny, as she went by, and her family, they had a little business with a few products that they produced, and one of those items was a bluing. I scoured far and wide, and I could not get the specifics on who in her family started the business, or how long they had it, or how successful it was. Any accounts that I found only mentioned her family business in passing. Then when she married this guy named Albert Stewart, or Al as he goes by, he took over the family business. They were married in 1875 and they had four kids, three daughters and a son. Al was a Civil War veteran. Well, he was in the military for all of four months. In 1880, he was listed as a grocer in Iowa. Here's 1882 showing he's a traveling salesman. He traveled many states in the Midwest. Here in 1884 directory, we are in Minneapolis, Minnesota. The ad says he's selling Mrs. Stewart's bluing, Mrs. Stewart's family remedy, along with Mrs. Stewart's furniture polish. The story goes that when Al thought to add his wife's photo to the label, she refused. But her mom said that it was okay if they wanted to use her picture. So her name was Mary Jane Taylor. Here's an article in 1887 stating that an oil stove at the residence of Mrs. Stewart exploded and she took the concern and threw it outdoors, displaying a good deal of pluck in doing so. Her timely action may have averted further damage. Here's one of the many articles talking about Al Stewart. He has a reputation by now of being a jolly traveling salesman. It also mentions that Al is also the owner of a hotel that he wouldn't mind getting rid of. It goes on to describe how he was part of this consolidation movement, and I'm not exactly sure what they're describing here. I can only imagine he's buying up some properties. It says, so confident was he of his success that he made a few wagers with some parties. He would jokingly write to them, expressing sympathy for the sad defeat they were sure to meet with. Apparently things did not go quite as well as he was expecting, so as he was stepping off the train, he found a procession, along with mourners along the road with their heads bowed. Al looks up and sees a consolidation hearse. Once Al caught on to the joke, he roared with laughter and ordered the hearse driver to stop at the next place liquid refreshments were served, while Al got back on the train with hopes of securing sympathy from his fellow mourners. It sounds like a good time was had by all. A few months later, Al had a fine calla lily removed from his garden, and he wants it returned. It says, Al promises to make it interesting if he has to resort to a search warrant. Okay, so he's fun, but he also means business. I've seen a lot of bits like this where Al would blow into town, and this one says, Al was in town today looking as sweet and fresh as a rose on a bright June morning. 1891, another lighthearted bet made by Al. He bet Mr. Thorpe a bushel of hand-picked buckwheat that a guy named Donnelly would be elected president of the Alliance, and Al lost. So Al paid up. It says Thorpe is waiting for Al to come around and make another bet. It sounds like Al shouldn't be making so many bets. <laughs> the newspaper always documented when he was in town, and a few times, like this one, it says our Norwegian friend. So I guess he's Norwegian lineage. He was known to have a basket of samples. The bluing was supposedly in these sample baskets. Now a Mr. Luther Ford enters the story. He was born in 1844 in Connecticut. He's only slightly older than Al. He married Sarah and they had three boys. The first baby died at nine months old. Now, Mr. Ford was also a salesman and in the 1880s, he had a popular five and 10 cent bazaar that sold little trinkets and toys. 
This ad here in 1884, he is selling Christmas cards, vases, tea sets, dolls, toys, harmonicas, and candies. Later on, he would sell fireworks. This article talks about a week before the 4th of July, how some boys stole some fireworks from him. Anyways, it's believed somewhere in the 1880s, Mr. Ford and Mr. Stewart crossed paths and Mr. Stewart sold Mr. Ford the bluing business. I can't find this transaction anywhere, but at some point Ford is selling the bluing and he kept the name and the label. The product already had a reputation, so Ford actually had bigger ideas for the product and he took it from being a local product and made it national. And this is where we pretty much part ways with jolly old Albert in this story. He remains a salesman until he died in 1918 and he's mentioned in the paper many, many more times. But now we gotta start following Luther Ford now. So let's go to 1900 where it shows his family. Luther Ford is 54 at this point. His wife, one of his sons is living with him and a servant. Uh, one interesting thing that I wanted to note is that earlier I said he had three boys and the first one died at nine months old, but this actually shows right here that she had four babies and only two of them survived. So another baby had died at some point. Skipping ahead to 1902, this says Ford and his wife just returned from California and they had spent some time with one of their boys who is a professor at the Polytechnic Institute. This one in 1902 shows that Ford just bought a hotel for $22,000. Here's a 1903 ad at a grocery store for the bluing. And in 1903, an ad for a competent German girl to help around the house. In 1904, he's still selling fireworks, so that makes it about 20 years now that he's been selling them. Here's a collection of snippets from 1904 to 1907 talking about his five and 10 cent bazaar. Here's a 1906 ad showing that the bluing is sold for about 10 cents a bottle. This 1906 article shows that there was a fire at the fireworks shop and it burned down. It's June 16th and they had their entire 4th of July stock in that warehouse when it caught fire. It says firefighters couldn't get close to put it out until the majority of the explosions were done. It says luckily no one was seriously hurt. The next year I see him trying to put a warehouse up for sale and I'm not sure if he has more than one. He does have the, the 5 and 10 cent store which sells different kinds of trinkets along with doing the firework thing, so I doubt that he does that all in one place. Here's 1910 census showing Luther Ford, and he lists that he's manufacturer of bluing. I thought it was interesting that he considers his main occupation as being a manufacturer of bluing as opposed to being a salesman, but I think at this point, he's actually focused 100% on the bluing. One of his sons is living at home, Alan, and he's also a partner in the business. One thing that the Ford family was involved in was called the Crittenton Home. This article describes it as a home to save young girls who were victims of white slave traffic in Minneapolis. Luther Ford was the treasurer of this home. In 1910, I see the five and 10 cent bazaar, but it's under a different name. So like I suspected, he doesn't run that anymore. In 1911, he's fighting the city council because they were trying to restrict the sale of fireworks. He calls it unjust discrimination, but he agrees that maybe some regulations are okay. Quick side rabbit hole. Um, it was just too interesting to leave out. This is an article on Luther Ford's mother-in-law. She's 108 years old when she died. She was born in 1806 and she died in 1914. She was a descendant of Roger Williams who founded Rhode Island, which is where she was born. One of her ancestors built a house in 1690 on property purchased from the Indians for quote, 144 fathoms of wampum page. And this house had stayed in the family for over 200 years. Seven generations lived here and 55 children had been born in that house. Her family was prominent in society and participated in politics. At this time, she was the oldest living member of the DAR, Daughters of the American Revolution. 
She came from good stock as many of her family lived into their 90s. She had nine children and her husband died 30 years before her. I put a link to the history of the Watermans if you wanted to dig into that more. We're up to 1920 and we see what his house looks like. Luther and his wife, both sons live here now and both work with him. Actually, as I studied the document a little bit more, I noticed that Luther is listed as the head of the household, but the wife is listed as widowed. I went and checked and he died in January 1920. So I checked for a date on the census and the enumerator doesn't put one. I checked through several pages and I couldn't find a date. So it must have been in January and his death had just happened. It shows the enumerator actually spoke to the son, Alan, by this little cross here. And he lists his dad as the president, himself as vice president, and his brother Robert as manager. Here's a passport photo of Alan from right around this time. Luther Ford's obituary in the paper says that he and his wife were making huge party preparations to celebrate their golden wedding anniversary next year. It says his five and 10 cent bazaars were believed to be one of the first stores of that kind in the country. It says he had the largest fireworks plant. It also says that more recently he was president of the Luther Ford Company, which manufactures the bluing full time. By 1925, there were bluing factories in five different states. Distribution was nationwide across the United States and Canada. Robert and Allen ran the business for about 30 years until they handed it to Robert's son, who happened to be named Luther, in the mid 50s. Luther had a guy named Ken Norman as manager of production and purchasing. Well, that guy Ken had a son named Brad and Brad took over ownership in 1995. He co-owned it with a guy named Jeff Olson and in 2013, Jeff took over ownership. Now, I don't know about you, but I was trying to understand how bluing works. Bluing was used in laundry to help combat whites turning a dingy gray color. The older package directions say to soak the laundry in hot soapy water in a large kettle over a stove or in a wash tub, then rinse the laundry once or maybe twice. In a different kettle, cool water was put in with just enough bluing added to make the water a light sky blue color. Then the laundry was dipped in and then it's hung out to dry. Mine is similar directions. I have to admit, I thought that it was actually washed in the bluing. The earliest Mrs. Stewart's bluing bottles were hand blown. Then about 1907, the bottles were blown in an early machine. The words, this contains Mrs. Stewart's bluing were embossed on the front of the bottles to make sure that the bottles weren't reused. Around 1920, the embossing was around the shoulder of the bottle. In 1933, Robert Ford started to apply hot wax around the rim of each bottle to prevent the liquid from running down the side of the bottle when you tried to pour it. This soon became the patented no drip process. The top of each bottle cork had the words no drip bluing. In the 1960s, plastic screw caps replaced the wooden corks. In the 1970s, they switched to plastic bottles, and you can still buy Mrs. Stewart's Bluing today. So my bottle has a date on the label that says 1940. The label says that you can also use it as an ink, which I found an ad for here. I was reading that the cork was dipped in wax before it was corked in the bottle to ensure a tight fit, and I'm still trying to figure out this topper though. So let's look at this for a minute. It says Bulldog Echo USA and a patent number. And in the center, it's got a removable pin that says press. Well, I found some examples on Google and this one shows one in the package. It says keeps the fizz in. I guess with it being bluing and it could stain things easily, they wanted an extra tight seal on it. The rubber is kind of melted to the bottle at this point and I can't even pull that out. I don't think you would see this nail part during normal use, but I think over time the nail has separated from the rubber. I didn't get too involved in researching the Echo Products Company, 
but they are still in business and you've probably owned one of their products at some point. And that about wraps up this story. I hope everyone's doing well and we'll see you soon on the next episode. Thanks for watching.